uh, and we'll pause the pause the recording then but this session will be recorded so uh, anybody who couldn't make it today um, can see um, the recording. So again my name is Abby Sidani, I'm based in the United Kingdom, I'm a children's physiotherapist and a lecturer um, in physiotherapy. I'm also one of the co-leads along with my colleague Pia uh, for, of the PSYOP um, Rehabilitation and Physical Medicine Special Interest Group. Uh, I'd like to thank you all, as I said there's uh, so many people attending, uh, it's a weekend so we're very grateful for you taking the time out uh, to attend today and we really um, hope and we know uh, that you'll get a lot out of, out of today's session. I want to now uh, thank our three wonderful presenters uh, for taking their time um, to deliver this session today uh, on um, peripheral neuropathy and I'm going to just briefly introduce them to you. So first of all um, we have uh, Lynn Tanner. Lynn Tanner is a physio physiotherapist, or physical therapist, I should um, call her how, by how she's, um, she's called in, in the United States. Um, she has a PhD um, and um, she is the scientific director of the physical medicine and rehabilitation at Children's uh, Minnesota in, in the United States. She's also CEO and founder of Your Steps Health. Um, and as a physio, Lynn has worked um, treating children with cancer for um, over 22 years. And her research, I'm sure, um, you know, with all our uh, presenters today, you'll, you'll um, know that they have published widely. Um, and her research interests include assessment and intervention of children with neuropathy, physical therapy models of care in paediatric and access to paediatric rehabilitation. Next, we have Catherine Demers. Catherine is an occupational therapist. Catherine has a PhD. Uh, she's based in Canada. Uh, she's a postdoctoral fellow at the University of British Columbia, and she's working within the Child Bright Network. She's currently uh, conducting research focused on implementation of best practices in paediatric rehabilitation. And she completed her master's and PhD in rehabilitation science at McGill University. And her past and current research interests lie in the area of paediatric oncology, rehabilitation and health promotion. Um, and next we have uh, Dr. Nathan Rosenberg. Um, he's a paediatric rehabilitation physician um, based at the Nationwide Children's Hospital in Ohio in the United States. He's a medical director of the Rehabilitation Inpatient um, Consultation Service and additionally participates in outpatient clinics and he cares for children with um, lots of different conditions including cancer but also cerebral palsy, brain injury, spinal cord injury um, uh, and anything that impacts how a child is uh, how, on a child's function. And he's a member of the Neuro-Oncology and Cerebral Palsy Comprehensive Care clinic team. So they are our three presenters. Once again, we're very grateful to have them. Uh, as you can see, it's a multidisciplinary panel we have. So we're very lucky. We have a physiotherapist, an occupational therapist, uh, and a rehabilitation doctor. Um, and aside from them being excellent clinicians, I also want to say they are all wonderful individuals. So we are very, very lucky to have some such wonderful people um, join us today. We've been involved in projects and initiatives uh, and networks and other presentations over the years. So um, I'm delighted to, um, to have them join us today. That's all for me. Uh, I know you'll enjoy the session. So I'm going to hand over now um, to our presenting team. Thanks very much. Thanks, Abu. Um, I will get us started here. So just a reminder to everyone, please join SIOP, um, join our group and interact with us on SIOP Connect. And here is just the, the prices, I guess, of um, allied health professionals for your info. All right, Nathan. Hi. So um, I, it's good to see you guys. Good to be with you all here. Some familiar faces out there. Um, we we were talking earlier before we did this talk, and we 
came to the conclusion that the lecture lecture as a teaching mode and as a learning mode is kind of dead in 2024 and, and we're happy about that actually and so consider this interactive from the beginning while we do have slides and we have content uh jump in jump in with your microphone with your video jump in on the chat to say hey here's a thought or a question or can we talk about this we have a bunch of slides we don't even necessarily need to get through them as much as it is content for us to speak i think I think the three of us were able to conclude that happily that there is the wisdom is is in the crowd. And so um, hopefully this will be an interactive opportunity. Okay. Take it away, Lynn. Perfect. All right. I'm just going to introduce the topic. So hopefully five minutes or less of lecture. Uh, so what is chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy? I'm sure many of you know. It is damage to the long nerves of the body. So it tends to be kind of a stocking glove distribution. Although it's important to know, so hands, feet, ankles, wrists, right? Uh, worse peripheral than proximal. However, it, it, it can impact more than just the feet and ankles. So I think that's important to remember. Um, depending on the chemotherapy agent used, and also, of course, the individual reaction to the medication, um, there are, are different uh, amounts or impact of the neuropathy. So they may have more motor, especially uh, for vincristine. Vincristine typically is a predominant motor neuropathy, although it does also have a sensory component. But there's other medications like brentuximab or bratezomib that tend to be more sensory in nature. And that is um, due to how those medications impact the nerve and what type, um, what structure uh, they damage. There also can be autonomic uh, changes as well with neuropathy. So when we look at prevalence, um, in a systematic review I recent co recently completed, uh, in different studies, it, um, it is, it, ranges from 78 to 100% of kids on treatment uh, has signs of neuropathy. And unfortunately, it's important to know that this doesn't go away for many of our kids and survivors. So the prevalence off of treatment is up to 68%, depending on studies. So common agents, and this is not an exhaustive list. So there are new um, Drugs being used all the time, fortunately, because they're improving cure, right? But we also don't know their impact. So I think these are common agents that we know currently, but we need to keep an eye out for these new medications. So vincristine, cisplatin, carboplatin, frentuximab, and so on. So when we talk about physical function, and I and I and I want to say physical function and other types of function, right? Communication, for example, um, is also impacted by neuropathy. But we know that many of our kids are impacted. So over 80% of children and adolescents, um, their function is impacted during treatment. And for many, this doesn't go away. So long-term survivors greater than 10 years after treatment is completed, also still show functional limitations that can be related to neuropathy. So what kind of functional changes do we see? We see hand and ankle weakness. We see loss of ankle flexibility, um, impacted gait and gait capacity. And what I mean by gait capacity is, you know, it's one thing when you watch a child walk down the hall. It's another when you watch them walk for five, 10, 15 minutes, and um, I can tell you in the six minute walk test, our research shows that the, you, the assessment changes as they walk longer. So you can see the impact of neuropathy as they walk longer. Running speed is impacted, motor proficiency. So skills like fine motor skills and running, jumping, um, um, playing sports, right? All can be impacted by neuropathy and swallowing can be impacted. So you, you think about our kids are at risk for pneumonia and what that can do, right? So can neuropathy impact the risk of, of pneumonia, for example? And bowel and bladder function. So 
kids can um, definitely have um, issues with constipation during treatment. Then when we look at physical activity and quality of life, what do we know from the research? Well, there's difference. There's a difference in long-term quality of life in survivors who have neuropathy and in those that don't. We also know that our survivors, uh, their physical activity levels are below guidelines, whether it's, you know, there are many guidelines published um, in different countries, but we, we know that our kids are not as active as we need them to be. And it's, and, and they're not as active as their siblings, right? So, so it seems to be um, impacted by their treatment. All right, I am going to pause the recording just to show some videos here of our Zoom recording. Okay. Do we want to so, open the floor maybe to, to uh, participants? To tell us what what they thought about the the videos, if the, if it's something that they normally see in their practice, um, if they have questions, feel free to just unmute yourself and uh, jump in. They just want to listen to us talk. We got a comment from a person labeled iPhone user or Zoom user, unfortunately. So we don't know who it is, but um, there was a comment in there suggesting MPLUX MCP subluxing um, on the hands video and limited opposition with the thumb to fingers. Yeah, and it's something that we will talk about maybe a bit later, um, but you could definitely see the, the little claw hands um, with the MCP being in extension and then the fingers being... Um, more flexed, even when she was grabbing, uh, you know, the 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 different objects, she would grab it like that instead of extending her fingers. So that's all um, things that we very typically see in children. Um, and we can talk a bit more about that later. But nice observation. Catherine, do you, do you go ahead? Go ahead. As if you if they came in that day, what would and you saw her walking down the hall or saw her hands, what would you want to ask the family? That was me that made the comment. It's Lizzie from Newcastle Frontline in the UK. It was a question to all of us, Lynn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, cutlery, eating, handwriting, self-care, buttons, all of those kind of things. I can put a camera on. And 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 I will tell you how the family answered. They said that day she to eating. She's they said she used to be able to use her hand, her um spoon and fork, and now she's picking up it up, using it for a little bit, putting it down, and then picking up the plate and eating like this. That was yep. their main concern that day. Okay. Or well, usually, or well, we now do it for her. <laughs> it's what I hear mm -hmm. a lot of too. Anything a else question there. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, please. Go ahead. So a question out there for folks. I'm wondering, in your practices, do you ever see hand findings showing up more predominantly than foot and ankle findings, or is it usually foot and ankle first, uh, at foot, ankle, knee, whatever it ends up being? Um, foot and ankle first and hand second. Or do, do we have those phenotypes where folks come in where it's hands first in anybody's practice? I would say in in my practice, it tends to be more lower extremities first. However, there is, you can see it opposite, right? You can see it just in, I have some kids with just it in their hands and they have very minimal findings in their lower extremities, but I think most often, most often, um, it's in lower extremities more. It's been my experience. Yeah, if I can, um, in my experience, sometimes I think the the feet might be a, more obvious first. Not that it's affected first, but it's more obvious because you 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 really see the the impact on walking. The hands, um, you could you can uh, compensate more. So mm -hmm. even if the child is not using, for example, the fingers or not opposing the the, the, the thumb. 
you tend to notice it maybe a bit later when it really has an impact on like in this video on on eating or uh, writing but for younger yeah. children sometimes when they they use their whole hands then you can maybe notice it later and it's not that it's 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 there later it's just that it's it's less obvious i guess mm -hmm. so so lynn coming out of chat uh we have a few questions about the case there's one case about when was the last chemo and which one is the next one Mm -hmm. So um, I want to ask you that one and maybe ask at the same time, did she have other autonomic dysfunction, for example, obstipation? Mm -mm. So, yes. So she had um, her chemo was a week before that. So it was. However, she had she was also 12 to 13 weeks in. Right. So she had cumulative doses. And something we know about research in vincristine and doses is that um, right now in the literature, it um, it is not necessarily dose dependent severity. Now I'm, I think we're still learning about that, but if you look across the number of studies um, and different types of cancer and different doses, it's it's also not um, dose dependent as we know right now. Uh, also, let's see, what was the other question? I'm sorry, Nathan. The one about obstipation, about other oh, autonomic dysfunction. Constipation. She, um, she definitely, <laughs> she definitely struggled with constipation. And I will tell you, I struggled with constipation for years. Years. And um, here, I'm going to implicate <laughs> physicians here. How often in your practice do you see that physicians are able to or will consistently implicate that constipation to the chemotherapy versus saying, your kid with constipation, go change your diet? They'll be told to change their diet. I think during treatment, it can be recognized, oh, this could be related to your to your your chemo, right? Um, but I, I have had families discuss and be um, saddened. I think by later on when they're really working, they're really working on diet, you know, they're, uh, they might be on something like Miralax, they might be really working on fruits, they might be working on, you know, water intake. And um, per the family's perspective, they're feeling that their efforts are not being recognized uh, for the constipation when really they're doing all these things. And it is actually a side effect of a drug that maybe they can't at that time control. So I think it's often missed, especially later on. Yes to that. Yes to that. Um, you guys, should we keep rolling through the chat. We got a great active chat, which is what we dream of when we do these things. So um, a great question that it says it may not be a question for now, but I think it is. Um, uh, curious if there's scientific evidence out there to say, do AFOs, I'm going to try to reword this a bit, do AFOs impact the long-term recovery, as in do the AFOs change a person's natural course, or are they useful while they're being worn uh, as a tool, but the second they go off, they don't have a long-term impact? So is it, do we have a feel? So there's yeah. a, the question A is science, and the question B is what's our clinical opinion? Um, yeah. So, Lynn, can you we, probably know the science. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, how about, can we hold that question for the intervention piece? Because I can speak to that uh, more then. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So, let's talk kind of more about subjective history. So, you know, we ask if they've noticed any change in their movement. And I think, you know, that can be, families, it's amazing what they can pick up. So, I they're their their child's best advocate and they know their children. So have you noticed any any ways, you know, have you noticed any changes in the way they move, the way they walk, the way they run? Um, have they changed things that they play with? You know, for example, I've had a number of young kids that the the families will say, well, they they used to love to color, but now it's just not their interest. And to me, that's kind of a red flag. Really, did they lose red interest or is it that it's harder? And so they just have chosen something else, you know? Um, same thing for, you know, I've, 
for for gross motor activities, right? If they used to love to climb up the slide and now all of a sudden they're not doing it anymore, what is that? You know, it could be, a, you know, that they change their interests, but it also could be a sign of neuropathy. Um, numbness and tingling, we asked about that and that's in some of our assessment tools too. But I will say for young kids, um, you know, they're not going to maybe be able to speak to that. So we'll talk to the families about, do you, does your, is there anything that your child does that you think they're in any type of pain or that their hands or feet feel different? Is there anything your child does? And, and we'll have families say things like, you know, they're asking, they want band-aids on their fingers. They want band-aids on their fingers. Could that be it? You know? Um, and so there's there's little things. They talk about it being fuzzy or they wake up in the middle of the night and they are grabbing their feet. Things like that, right? So talking about pain, also, of course, we know this, I think as we have professionals, but what are activities they enjoy to do? We need to know that because we that'll that's how we're gonna get them to do exercises, right? Finding activities they enjoy, putting activities in there. And what do they want to do better? You know, as as kids are older, they of course, uh, you know, they can tell you when they're two or three what they want to do better, right? So make sure to ask them, not just the parents. <laughs> Dang. Um, and then, like I said, younger children stopping doing anything different. Catherine, do you have anything to add at all to that? How about you, Nathan? I'll say that um, I don't. I, and asking these questions, I don't think it's fair to rely on physicians to ask them as much as a, a lot of us that we kind of, it, it is nailed maybe specifically into the pediatric rehabilitation curriculum, but it's only a subset of us too that are eager to actually think about activities because there's so much disease eradication that's done from a physician perspective. And so mm -hmm. um, I think I think it's a fault in our field actually to not get to the point of activities. Uh, and activity limitation and use the um oh the ICF the international classification of function um which I'll cite if you guys haven't seen the ICF I'll I'll cite it in the uh in the comment section but to think about that it all comes back to activities. Mm -hmm. Activities and participation. All right let's go to assessment tools. So what do you currently use in your practice to understand if they have neuropathy or not, to assess if they have neuropathy. Feel free to unmute or put things in the chat. So the PEDS MTNS, so the Pediatric Modified Total Neuropathy Score. Anything else? Mm, yeah, the BOT2, so the Brunix Osiretsky Test of Motor Proficiency. Looking at strength and agility, Sarah Fisher. Yeah, the, I like that, the complete form. The complete form of the BOT2. I know in some research, the short form is used, which, you know, sometimes makes sense for research when you're trying to do a lot of things. The complete form is nice. The bot form and the PEDS MTNS. I have a question. What do you do for younger children? Two, age two, age three. It's harder. All right, we don't have a tool. Mm -hmm. Philip is saying we, we it's a problem because we don't have a tool. Um, so, so the ones we came up with is yes, the pediatric modified total neuropathy score. It's um has been is reliable and valid in the pediatric oncology population. And I'll have Catherine speak to the graphic there. 
Yeah, so I've um, added a little timeline here, and this is really just an example. Um, so it's something that's being worked on at, at St. Justine in Montreal, um, and it's in collaboration with the rehab team and the oncologist who specializes in um, treating lymphoma patients. So they are trying to standardize the way um, neuropathy is evaluated, but also when. So for example, here, um, it's a treatment of six cycles uh, for lymphoma patients with a prentuximab. And they tried to uh, evaluate the, all the patients that received this specific treatment at very specific time during their cycle to be able to um, see the progression of neuropathy, but also adapt and maybe modify um, the treatments if necessary. So that's something that you can always uh, try to implement in your clinics, work as a team, try to define where and when and how you would like to best um, evaluate the, the neuropathy. And it it it's not, realistically, it, it might not be possible to do it for all patients. But if you choose a specific population that you know that is at high risk of having a neuropathy with a lot of functional impact, then it's um, it's very useful. Mm -hmm. I think it, the nice thing about that is, for example, in at our institution with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, we assess neuropathy every three months in their intense phases, and then every six months until they're within normal levels um, in a maintenance phase. And what we have found by doing that is. When you use the same time points, you can compare a child to another child, right? So then you're able to communicate more, mm, you know, this child now in delayed intensification, which is a phase of acute lymphoblastic leukemia treatment, they're, they're really impacted a lot more than other children we're seeing at this time point, right? That's something you communicate to the medical team and then they can make decisions on treatment based on that. So that is uh, that tool use it has functional testing. It also has clinical testing of sensation um, and strength and reflexes. Importantly, I read an article recently that said reflexes is actually the most accurate way to look at neuropathy because it's very sensitive. Um, but we can look at sensation. So. You know, if you don't have the tool, that's okay. You can look at light touch, um, whether it's just with light touch of your fingers, what they feel. That would be pretty severe, though, for them not to feel it. Um, or you can use some Weinstein monofilaments. Okay, 2.83 is the size that's normal in the fingers. That's an adult, so I'll say. <laughs> um, and 3.22 is um, the size for the feet. You could like that point dull right? Whether you're using a safety pin or you're using a tool like a medi pin, looking at the difference in point dull, um, vibration testing, and reflexes. Uh, we do manual muscle tests and dy dynamometry. And you can do dynamometry of ankles, grip, and pinch if you have it available. Um, if not, manual muscle tests. What I would say about manual muscle tests, though, is know what is normal, right? And I think that's hard because the difference between a five and a four, right, is not necessarily standard across our professions and also across um, ages. So it's good to test a lot of different people, kids that are on treatment, so you can feel in your hands, you know, how strong is a five-year-old? How strong is a 10-year-old? So you can really feel what a five is. Um, so for gait, uh, observation gait analysis, make sure you're looking at, you know, um, their initial contact, if they have knee hyperextension, how they're activating at their ankle, their base of support. Six minute walk test is a great easy test that you can do anywhere. Um, balance, jumping, jumping distance, jumping over, right? And motor proficiency. So just like a lot of people mentioned, um, we use the bot, although I know the movement ABC is used um, in some places. 
There's a GM FM ALL is used in some places. Catherine, I'll hand it over to you. Um, so for uh, fine motor skills, ideally you would uh, conduct a comprehensive evaluation that covers the fine motor skills. Um, and for that you have, you can just use general observation or you could use a standardized assessment. So like you, everybody said, uh, most of you seem to be using the BOT2. Uh, you could also use the MABC. Uh, in this case, as it's not research for just clinical purposes, you could use only the subscale that you're interested in. So only the, um, the fine motor subscale. Um, you, um, you have also to evaluate or at least ask questions about the activities of daily living. So for example, for school age uh, children, you would uh, look at writing. Um, again, it can be standardized or not. You can just observe a child writing or you could use a writing assessments. Um, it all depends on, on your needs and what, what you have um, in your clinic. You can use uh, you can look at the the in hand manipulation so uh, fingers to palm or palm to fingers translation. Um, you have to look at the range of motion, um, the wrist, the hand, the fingers, um, and really with an emphasis on the thumb, as we know that it's the most important finger in your hand, um, and the thumb will have a a huge impact on on all your 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 functional outcome your all your tasks um which is why i wrote here i don't know if some of you are, are familiar with it but we use the the cap and g um score does somebody have a question i I'm, I'm um so the the cap and g score uh, it it provides a scoring of the thumb opposition on a scale of zero to 10, based on where on their hand the patient is able to touch with the tip of their uh, thumb. So that's very useful, very easy to do. Um, and at least you have a number that you can compare over time. Um, finally, you can also evaluate the, the dexterity by using either the Purdue pegboard for older kids or the 9 peg test uh, for the younger ones. And those are all options. Uh, you should not use all of them. Um, so for example, if you use a standardized assessment like, like but two, you don't have to use the nine old pick test uh, in addition. Um, but overall, I think a combination of, of strength, range of motion, and functional activities uh, that are age appropriate. I think somebody had a good point that, that we did miss on this slide um, is looking at range of motion. Like you said, Catherine, we look at passive and active uh um dorsi flexion range of motion um in the ankles we also look at great toe extension range of motion because if that is that can easily get tight in neuropathy and that impacts your push off and gait and it also impacts things like your ability to do a lunge if you don't have great toe extension doing a lunge the balance in your lunge is hard And I see another comment here. Uh, do you also use the box and block? Uh, yes, you can, of course. Um, and I would say that things that are important, if you use, for example, the box and block, the um, uh, nine old peg test, is not only to look at the numbers. So not only the number of seconds it takes to to bring the box the, the blocks to one box to uh, to another, but really the qualitative um, information will be very important here. So how. Does the child grab the 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 block or the the peg the the hand hand manipulation of 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 the different um, objects? That's really what you're uh, looking for here. I think there was um discussion and and you guys are doing a great job talking about this because yes, it is a problem, especially in induction in acute lymphoblastic leukemia, to make sure you're differentiating between what is steroid myopathy and what is neuropathy. And so doing some of these assessments, understanding reflexes, um, looking at you know the, the severity of weakness from peripheral to proximal 
can help you understand that because I know we, you know, when kids stop walking, it might be easy to say, oh, this is neuropathy when, when really it might just be myopathy or due to deconditioning, right? So uh, being able to differentiate that. We also added uh, for those speech therapists out there, you do need to get involved in these kids. Um, they have a swallowing dysfunction, voice quality, and, um, you know, I think all of us um, need to understand because if a child is constipated, that greatly impacts their life, impacts their movement, impacts their nutrition. So really kind of taking that whole holistic approach. All right. So yeah, it's just an update from the chat. There's some great discussion going on in the chat. I wonder if the, if the recorded version of this, if the chat's all visible. Um, um, so a quick summary in chat, there's a lot of talk about differentiation between steroid myopathy and then Christine peripheral neuropathy in those young children who quote unquote can't walk. Um, and specifically patients with uh, those of us with that care for folks with Hodgkin's lymphoma really trying to figure out the difference uh, and because been figuring out what our assessment tools are. There's some the discussion in the cat the chat also about the Kapanji, K-A-P-A-N-D-J-I score and scale. Uh, and so there's some links in there. I think YouTube has a lot of good ways to take a look at that. Um, oh, Abu. Abu mentions guess the owner of the foot. Uh, no comment. Um, so let's 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 look at the foot for a second. Um, coming out of the chat here. So um, one of my favorite tools I mentioned in the chat too for assessing for um, peripheral neuropathy is, is the presence of the extensor digitorum brevis on the top of the foot. It's the only muscle I trust on the top of the foot. Um, and so Sorry. I want to draw, oh, we lost it. Lynn, are you still controlling there? Yeah. I was, I was looking to be able to circle it because that's fun. Um, oh, shoot. There. Yeah. No, that'll stop screen sharing. Not doing that. Okay. Well, there's the arrow. Good. Okay. So, um, so that there's extensor digitorum brevis. I like to document its presence ideally before somebody goes on treatment. Uh, for me, it's binary: yes or no. Is it there or is it not? And it does go away. And Lynn, if you advance a slide one, it's a different foot. I couldn't make that uh, extensor digitorum brevis disappear on that individual foot because that's my foot, and I still have one. Um, I couldn't find a great picture, so it became my foot. Abu, you know this from prior talks. It's It's been recycled. <laughs> uh, but yes, um, knowing the differences is, is really helpful. And actually just yesterday, um, we were able to to do that as a case in point because this child, when he before he started treatment, he didn't have Achilles reflex. And Lynn, as you mentioned, um, the Achilles reflex is a, a really useful tool to tell if and when somebody develops peripheral neuropathy. I couldn't use Achilles reflexes because he didn't have them before. Why not? I don't know. But he did have really um, large extensor, extensor digitorum brevis. He's eight. And so he was able to extend his toes and show it to me. And and then his gait got wider in base. I went and saw him and um, and his extensor digitorum brevis was gone. His active range of motion, strangely, was about the same. Uh, and so we couldn't use active range of motion as a tool. And so that was the one tool that, that felt diagnosed, diagnostic to us, which I find helpful. Very Enough of my foot now, please. Thank you. <laughs> and yeah, if we... Take a look at the 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 hand. Also, I think the um, I would say that the top three things uh, that you should be looking for is first the arches of the hand. Um, so what we tend to see is a hand that's really flat. Um, so there's no round here when you look at the palm of the hand. Uh, you lose all your 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 arches. Um. And you could see it in the video of, of, of the little girl that her hand was was really flat. And when even when she was grabbing object, usually what you would see is the, the hand getting round. But for her, it, it stayed very, very flat. Um, the second thing that, that you uh, look for are the, the little claw uh, fingers. Again, it was very obvious in the videos. You could see both, both of her hands we're in, in the little claw position. Um, even when she was at 
even when she was using her hands and grabbing objects, the 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 tip of her fingers were staying flexed. Um, so she was mostly grabbing the 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 object with her whole hand um, instead of 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 her individual fingers. Um, and this is all caused by weakness of of the hand muscles. Um, and third is the thumb that is usually keep uh, kept adducted in the hand. So here or even sometimes inside of the palm. Um, and that obviously can result in a loss of uh, the opposite opposable function. Mm -hmm. um, so these are all um, elements that are important to look for because that leads to a weaker and a less secure grip uh, that we see very often in children. I would um, say too, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. I was just gonna, I, I didn't, so she, um, she had a manual muscle test of one, she had trace movement, trace of her ankle dorsiflexors, and she, uh, I mean, that day, I couldn't get her to activate her toe extensors or flexors, so she was unable to wiggle her toes, on that day but you can see how how kids are missed right because when you watched her walk she was walking I mean she likes to move so she figured it out she used her hips um and she would almost kind of run and prance and this is something that we have to explain to our families is that the wonderful thing is many kids like to move and so they'll figure it out however those compensations might hinder their ability to improve, right? Because they'll 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 kind of turn off the messages from their brain down to those toe muscles, down to those ankles, down to their hands. Um, and and we need to, that's what therapy is about, right? Saying, hey, hey, no, no, wake up those muscles, wake up those nerves, right? They still work, they still work, it's not as well. You know, and so I I think um we didn't do the PEDS MTNS with her because she was too young. Um, but she was able to do monofilament testing and her sensation was normal in monofilament. So her monofilament and her point dull was normal. Questions from the chat here, Catherine. Um, do you see loss um, interossei too or space there um, between interossei or with interossei? Um, yeah, we do, but it has, um, the functional impact I would say is maybe, uh, less important. Um, maybe that's why I didn't mention it, uh, but yeah, we do see, uh, inter muscle here, um, being affected. Um, and I see another, another comment about the atrophy of the tenor and hypotenor eminences. Of course. Yeah. You see it. It's that's why the, the hand is so flat. Um, definitely a, a big loss in the muscle uh, here. So would you say more useful as a diagnostic tool than as a than as a a, a target for therapy? Yeah. For interest, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we'll, for time, move on to intervention ideas. Yeah. So what does everybody do for intervention? I know there's many things we do. Therapy. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I I have no idea how to do therapy, but I I, I know how to write write for it. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we definitely do stretching, right? So, um. We do stretching of the ankles, of the toes, of hamstrings, of hip flexors, right? If they have compensated movements, their hip flexors get tight. And Catherine, I'll pass it to you for stretching. Yeah, so stretching of the hands also, especially if you have those little claw hands, extending the fingers, playing with, with younger children, uh, playing with just 
um, putting a bit of, of weight bearing on their hands and really making sure that the hands are fully extended. Uh, you can also do just passive stretching, um, but try to, 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 to have big open hands and um, you can stretch and, but you can also massage the hands. And when you do massage, really try to get those arches in your hand. So really push very hard in the, 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 the palm here and then make some, 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 some rounds, bring the thumb forward, make sure that your, your, your hands are in a functional position. Some other position. things from, oh, from chat. Yeah, just some notes from chat that that um, stretching is mentioned again here, and then gait training, uh, and then a lot of the sensory aspects of so stimulation, tactile stimulation, uh, vibration if tolerated, and also a note for hand putty. Yeah, hand putty. Mm -hmm. My actually my my two favorite activities: hand putty, and what you see here um, next to distal extremity strengthening. Um, we, we take a tennis ball and then we just cut the tennis ball in the middle to make a mouth. And then with one hand, um, the child is pressing on the ball to open the mouth. Um, and when you're pressing on the ball, you have that big C here that is so useful to, to strengthen your, your muscles. So you press the ball here to open the mouth. And then with the other hand, you can do some, some in-hand manipulation. So for example, you would take something to, to, to give the, um, the little ball to eat. And you would do, for example, um, fingers to palm translation, and then feeding the, the ball with palm to finger translation. And then you switch hands. So you have manipulation in one hand and then strengthening with the other hand and you stretch and you switch and putty yeah the, the putty and um uh, stress balls very useful so we do a, i think a thing similar for the feet if you have them open their open their toes and then flex it to pick up little either little kush balls or little um craft pom-poms or right, or their favorite little figurines, whatever they have that is small, and have them um, grab it and then open it up and drop it in a container. And you can progress that to standing, right? So then you're getting balance and you're getting strengthening of the ankle and toes. Um, joint mobilizations, we do that for ankle dorsiflexion, definitely. Um, we do it sometimes in like a half kneel position, so they can also get some peripheral strength or some proximal strength while we do it. Um, nerve flossing techniques. So, so nerves can get tight. It's not just muscles. Um, so nerve flossing techniques um, also um, are helpful for this population. There was a question about orthotics. And uh, so this could be a whole day class. So I'm going to be brief. Um, we have seen the, if there is a published paper, uh, 2019 uh, on the stoplight, the implications of, or the long-term impact of the stoplight uh, program. And we use solid ankle AFOs in that program and showed that uh, kids, um, have improved gait efficiency and improved um, running speed and agility and balance um, after treatment is completed. So uh, you use solid, solid ankle AFOs. And a, and a big thing for that is, remember when I said kids are gonna move however way they want, right? And so what we have found is that with solid ankle AFOs, it, it, it forces the heel toe gait pattern as many steps as possible in a day. And the thing is, is when you use an orthotic, you don't turn muscles off. They don't stop working. They're still activating in, in that orthotic. And so what we find is, is that if we have an orthotic that encourages a heel toe gait pattern and increases step length, right? Because you need, um, you need the step length to get the flexibility, right? You're not gonna get 
you, if they're taking short steps all day, their gas stocks are going to be tight. So you get that long step length. You're you're stretching through their you're stretching through their gastroc soleus. You're stretching their hamstring, right? You're stretching their opposing hip flexor all day when they're walking. Um, so we've found uh, those orthotics to be very successful. We do not brace all our kids. If they have mild neuropathy, we strengthen stretch out of it. That is not you know. So there are many kids who are do who we have found do well with that. However. Um, if they have a significant gait impairment, we really find those orthotics to be helpful. Does anybody use any other types of orthotics? Well, there's the 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 articulated one with an ankle plantar flexion stop, usually set to zero degrees. Um, which is out there in practice. Um, the advantage that you get of that if you've lost some range of motion is that most of the custom ones you make right now, you can get night stretching straps attached to those, the magnetic night stretching straps, uh, which allows a little bit more functionality and range of motion. I would say it's hard for me to say gain. It's more so like range of motion, not loss. Um, and, and so, Lynn, I, I'm curious about your thoughts about why solid ankles are preferred over articulated AFOs. Yeah. So we have found that with articulated AFOs that um, if a child doesn't have range of motion and they're tempting to use it, that they break down the middle of their foot. They're, they're going to find the range somewhere. And so then they tend to use, so they break down their arch and they end up with navicular collapse. And so we use a solid ankle AFO and have actually, our pilot study showed improved range of motion um, with solid ankle AFO. So even though you're fixed at 90, they're taking longer steps. So because they're taking longer steps and the gastroc is a two joint muscle, um, we'll get stretching that way. So we actually really went to solid ankle AFO when we were looking at step length. And when we were looking at um, the loss, the these kids lose their arches over treatment and wanting to maintain their foot integrity so they can have good running speed and things in the future too. Does dorsiflexion, yes. So we showed that um, in children in a small pilot, so it's a small pilot um, that's published out there, but um, that kids actually get their dorsiflexors despite two additional doses of vincristine got stronger wearing solid ankle AFOs. Was one of the questions, sorry. So again, I said that, that could kind of be, we're, we're to the hour. So we're, go, we're going long, I apologize. But I think it's good because everybody's discussing. So I hate to kind of shut it down either. Lynn, Lynn, what do you think, Lynn and Catherine, what do you guys think about landing maybe uh, on a take-home point? I, and this is selfish if, I, uh, if I'm if i going to suggest one. It's at the end of our slides there. Um, the take-home point, which is a, we, we got, uh, though, you can skip this one. Stop in, Christine. Yeah. Um, but the, if maybe, do you guys think that shared decision-making team communication, where's a good place to finish? I like the shared decision-making team communication. I agree. Cool. Cool. So I guess we don't need slides as much to talk about it as to say that that I, I should, we should point out that here we are, something that's not a 10 years ago thing where, where we have representatives from maybe 25 countries all having a conversation right now uh, on Saturdays, on a Saturday, just not traveling to do it. Big deal, right? Um, so communications... Communication modalities are improving, and the question is, are, is communication itself improving in the clinical setting? So are people talking to each other? Um, we have some studies to suggest that when goals are written, these are cerebral palsy studies, but when goals are written, that less, if you ask the parents, did you write these goals, parents or kids, depending on the age, less than 20% of them said that they were involved in goal writing, which may, might make all of our heads explode. Uh, which so that brings in that concept of team communication as in um, between different disciplines, therapy disciplines, but also um, with um, between medical practice and therapy practice. And 
how important that is to find the people who have their doors open to doing that um, to eventually get to the point of shared decision making. Lynn or, Lynn or Catherine, what are your thoughts on shared decision making and how it applies to therapy practice and neuropathy? Yeah, I think, you know, shared decision making making occurs with the family, right? So what are their goals and how are they feeling of what they can work on right now within their current chaos? Cancer treatment is chaos, right? So where is the family and what what works for them at home? And, and what do they really want to work on now? Right. If you and I always say to a therapist, you know, I hear a lot of therapists talk about how the families aren't doing exercises at home. And I always see that as, well, that's really on me as a therapist, too. Like, how how can I understand what their life is like and put something in there? You know, like understanding what do they like to do? Um, you know, what are they doing at the dinner table? Right. Can everybody tap their feet at the dinner table while they eat for five minutes, right? You know, five minutes, that'd be a long time to tap your feet. But um, can everybody stand on one leg while they're brushing their teeth? Because hopefully everybody's brushing their teeth. Um, you know, so we can think about, you know, the families and what they're telling you and 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 listening and believing them and asking what they think would work for them. How can I help? you find find those little moments you know what are you concerned about what is how is cancer treatment impacting your family and you know what can you do with this right now you know I think that's important how about you Catherine yeah I totally agree and also if um if as a, as a kid your your hands and feet are affected then chances are that most of your daily living activities will also be affected. So um, trying to address everything and providing, you know, exercises for 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 everything is 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 too much, especially if you're, you know, going through cancer. So making a plan with the family with just a couple of goals and something that's very realistic for for the kid, for the family. Um, will be much more efficient than trying to just address everything and giving like a uh, a list of of things to do. So definitely working as a team, um, and also with the family, but with with each other. So maybe I could think that my goals are really realistic, but then if the the physio also has some goals, and then the speech therapist also has their goals then it's it's again too much for the family so working as a team with the family but with each each other also each other yeah i think that brings the point to team communication you know we we really are a part of cancer treatment i think that's important to me too to understand is that we're not in a silo over here you know so when you talk, think about team communication even more outside of the family it's also talking to your oncologist and talking to the physiatrist and talking to the psychologist on the team, talking to, you know, how can we all work together? And for us, you know, looking at neuropathy severity, making sure that if, if we see some red flags that we're, we're talking to the oncologist, there are some red flags here. And I always challenge therapists to, if you can, if it's possible, face-to-face -face communication with the oncologist, right? Um, if it's possible, sometimes it's not possible, but if it's possible, I think um, that will do a lot um, for the team. Understanding of pain medications, you know, that that impacts your your treatment and, and maybe, you know, you might be talking to the oncologist or physiatrist, you know, they're really, we, I feel that pain is limiting what they can do. Is there any, is there anything, um, we try not to use medications if we can though, I would say that. And then, you know, understanding the changes in cancer treatment. If the oncologists are deciding to stop being pristine, that's something for us to know. And it's, you know, and if they restart it, right? We can give feedback on, on what that looks like. So um, I think due to time, I think we're tight here. Um, unfortunately, 
Uh, so thank the, I, I, this is so great. I'm trying to figure out how many chat messages we had total. It's definitely a record for anything I've personally ever done, which is really exciting to hear. Um, so great to hear voices and um, or see voices in text and communication. Somewhere buried in all that chat is our three emails. Um, and we'd love to hear from you folks. We are, oh, look at that, also buried right here. So it's cut and paste available. Um, and and so I, I think what we've highlighted here is that we've covered just the ice, the tip of the iceberg. So um, please reach out to your friends in um, in this world to talk about what else we might want to cover or my, given, given uh, what we're hearing from folks out there, uh, I think we have some future speakers for this talk too. Um, and when I say speakers, I mean people that lead discussions. Everybody enjoy your day or your morning or your afternoon or your evening. Thanks everyone. See you Thanks. later. Thanks. Thank you for the wonderful evening.